Okay, good morning everybody. My name is Robin Rennie from Safe Software's Professional Services team and today we are going to use this webinar to demonstrate ways to utilize FME to load and extract Oracle data while preserving critical data information. Along with me today I have Steve McCabe who also works in professional services and he'll be assisting with some of the demonstrations. Good morning everyone. So this will be a one hour session and I'll first run through a quick um, overview of using FME with Oracle and then we'll start in on the demonstrations. We'll also have a quick look at how FME server can be integrated into your workflow basically for providing a web map front end to your Oracle data. Obviously this isn't a training session, we just don't have time for that so I'm going to have to gloss over many of the details due to the limited time we have. My objective is to provide you with some food for thought and hopefully just give you some ideas that will allow you to make the most out of your FME licenses that you might have. So we are recording this demo, uh, this webinar, and we'll send you the links to the recording and the slides as follow-up. Um, in addition, we have an offer at the end where you have the chance to win a free seat in some upcoming online training courses. So, so as we go through the presentation, please feel free to type in any questions you may have. In addition to myself and Steve, we have Mark Stokes, Manager of Professional Services. Hello. And Paul Nalos, the database team lead developer. Hello. Just along, just in case the questions get too technical. It's always good to have Paul here. So to submit a question, view the attendee control panel in GoToWebinar, click the minus sign beside questions to expand the pane, and then type in your question and click send. And one of these power users will help you out. If we don't get to your question during the webinar, we'll send you a follow-up email after the fact. So just before we get started, if we'd like to know something about you and how you're using the data that you've got stored in your Oracle databases, so um, Steve's going to run you through a little poll. All right. Thanks, Robin. Yeah, we got our first poll here. I'm going to launch that now. That should be coming up on the screen. So basically, what other applications are you using with your Oracle data? So we've got uh, a few choices there. Uh, so we'll let uh, we'll give you a few minutes or a few seconds to respond to that, and then I'll close it. We're up to about 20% of you have voted. Thank you very much so far. Okay, so just a few more seconds on that, and then we'll close that. All right, I'm going to close that now. Thanks everyone for for responding. Now I'm going to launch that, and share it with everybody. Okay, Robin. So we've got a we've got a, bit, a pretty uh, good split there, but uh, looks like Azure Geo Database and SDE is uh, the most popular one on the on the webinar today. Over that's, to you. That's great, and it's interesting to see how many people are using the uh, G Technology um, software. So great, thanks, Steve. So before we get started, for those of you that may not be familiar with us, Safe Software is a private company founded in 1993 with headquarters in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. We have around 95 employees and we also have a network of uh, value-added resellers and systems integrators, certified professionals and trainers all around the world. And these provide support, professional services and training to the thousands of customers we have in 116 different countries. So our goal really is to allow our users to achieve spatial, total spatial data mastery with FME. So I thought here, just to prove my point, we'd take a look at a very recent addition to our Oracle toolbox. Point cloud seem to have become a hot button topic in the uh, GIS industry right now, so we've added support for these in our Oracle readers and soon to be writers. So here we have some point cloud data it's stored in my Oracle database. And you'll notice it's just a standard point cloud. It got in there somehow. Someone provided me with a whole lot of information. Sorry, somebody on unplug my network cable. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just disconnect and I'll reconnect again. So we have um, point cloud data here. You'll notice it looks just like regular point cloud data. It's got a lot of information in it. So how do you, what do you do to work with that data? We've now added point cloud readers into our um, product and if you take a look we can open up that point cloud and view it in our new viewing tool, the FME Data Inspector. So you, some of you that have used FME before will be sort of familiar with our dialog boxes. We're connecting to our database. We're picking up our point cloud data. It shows us a few of the columns that we've got available to us, and I notice that I've got a column here that's got some intensity information in it, so I can identify that I'd like to take a look at that intensity data. 
And you can see the kind of information we're pulling out of our point clouds. We have a whole lot of uh, information we can get at. And when we click OK, the data inspector brings it into us and we're able to view it. So I can change this into 3D viewing, zoom in to take a closer look at it, and I can even fly around it. So I can fly around it and show the 3D nature of this kind of data. So that's just to whet your appetite for what's available with FME. Let me go back to my slideshow. So FME is designed to help people access spatial data in the precise way that they need it with powerful transformation tools, which allow you to reformat your data into any data model. We provide support for reading and writing for over 250 of the spatial and non-spatial data formats that are used by industry. Everything from the basic drawing formats like CAD, the AutoCAD, um, and MicroStation DGN formats, through to the more complicated building information modeling uh, formats and 3D, as you saw with the data inspector, and then more recently the point cloud LiDAR data, and of course your spatial databases and your corporate non-spatial databases. So FME's ability to transform your data takes place between the reading and the writing, allowing you to either reorganize or restructure your data, and it cuts through the repetitive, time-consuming con conversion processes and really complex data issues that let users get right at your data. So we also provide the ability to integrate different models into a single data model, allowing for production of output combining data from multiple sources, and we'll have a demonstration of that later on. So perhaps your Oracle database is the central repository for all your business data, but you're finding that more and more of it is required to have a spatial component to add business intelligence to that data. Or you might find that the data warehousing team down the hall has built a database with a complicated schema that might not fit the format of any of the data that you're importing, and so you need some kind of tool to pull that data into your database. Perhaps you're moving data out of a legacy system that can also require detailed data restructuring. So the way we do data restructuring is all is based around schema. And so for us, schema is front and center. And the schema varies depending on how the data is being presented, whether it's CAD versus GIS, or perhaps who owns the data. Is it a production database with all its rules and regulations, or is it a public database that everybody's got access to? So again, although it's great to have your data standardized and centralized, your field teams often require it in other formats for editing and display purposes. So with FME, it's possible to transform both the geometry of features as well as the attributes associated with those features. For instance, you could take line segment data into your workspace, merge it with the existing data, updating and inserting as required, or buffer that line work into polygons and store the area geomet geometries as additional information related to each of your features. We also work with the uh, attributes that come with your source, manipulating the attributes, fixing case is issues, except extracting substrings to set up key fields, and dropping other attributes that may not be of interest to reduce the clutter, that kind of thing. So the two products that Safe Software offers is our flagship FME desktop product, which allows for the kind of imports, exports, and transformation that we've been talking about, allowing you to access your spatial data in the precise way you need it. FME Server, on the other hand, broadens the scope of your processing to allow you to distribute your spatial data to users when, where, and how they need it. So let's start by taking a look at FME Desktop. So again, here we have another question, which Steve will take you through. Yep, thanks, Robin. All right, so we've got uh, just launched a question here. Which version of FME are you currently using? So we've got a selection of there from 2009 and older, 2010 and 11, and 2012 beta. We'll give you a few seconds there to answer that. Thank you, everyone, for, for, for responding so far. OK, I'm going to close that now. We've got a good response rate. Thank you. And I'll share it. So there we go. We've got uh, the brunt of the users on FME 2011. So that's good to see. All right, now we're going to follow that up closely with a second poll question. And is your organization currently using FME Server? So this is an easy one. Thank you very much for uh, for responding there. We got a good response, so I'm going to close that now. Give you a couple more seconds. Thank you. 
All right, so uh, yeah, a lot of you are not using FME Server at this stage. We're going to touch uh, a little bit on FME Server a little later in this webinar, so that's great. Did you want to see that other uh, slide there, Robin? Nope. That's, no, you're good? That's fine. Yep. Okay. No, nope, that's very interesting. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so then we don't need to go into too much detail because it seems like most of you are actually using FME, but for the, the few of you that I haven't yet taken that bold step, um, this is just a screen showing you what our desktop product looks like and how you can use it for um, you doing your restructuring tasks. So basically on the left hand side you can use, you define the source data you've got, your right, uh, right hand side is your destination data and in the middle is the transformation that's happening. And In this case we have a clipper that's doing some clipping against some polygon um, boundary areas, that kind of thing. So we have a lot of transformation tools for working with your data in the middle there. Along with that uh, Desk Workbench comes our viewing product, the Universal Viewer, which is gradually morphing into our data inspector. It allows you to examine your data before, during, and even after a translation. So you can watch your data as it passes through your uh, workbench. And the data inspector, you want to take a look at that if you haven't uh, used it before, but it's great for your 3D data, those point cloud, that point cloud data that you we saw earlier, that kind of thing. So. It's our new um, and up and coming. It was started in about FME 2010 and has been improved at each release after that. So now that you've had a look at FME, what we want to know is what forms of Oracle it is that you're using and then what versions, just to get a feel for um, the Oracle market that's out there. Yeah, thanks Robin. Okay, so we just put the poll up there. Which data models are you using? So we've got a selection of the, uh, the more probably current uh, model everybody's using to store geometry in, spatial and locator object relational. And the more, uh, the, the older legacy model, spatial relational model, and then if you're not even using spatial at all, you're just using tabular data in your Oracle database. So we've got, uh, got a good response right there. Okay, I'm just going to give you another five or ten seconds. Thank you. Okay, guys, there we go. I'm going to share those results now. So I'll let you comment on that, Robin. That's interesting that the Oracle Spatial Relational Model is still being so heavily used, but I imagine that's our G Technology customers <laughs> that be. are out there doing that. So okay. great, and then there's a good percentage of people using um, non-spatial. So we'll hope to transform your non-spatial into spatial data yeah. over the course of the morning. And now we have a, a, another uh, related uh, poll question here. What version of Oracle are you using? So this will be interesting to see uh, see the spread on this one here. I suspect that it'll be pretty even across the most of them. Well, it looks like we got a lot of 10G out there. All right, thank you very much. The response rate's really good. Uh, I'll give you another five or ten seconds. Well, that's good. Okay, I'm going to close that now. Thank you, everyone, and I'll share that with you. So there we go. It looks like we've got. Uh, across the board, but the brunt are still uh, running 10G, so that's, that's good to know for us here support, for support. Thank mm -hmm. you. All right, Robin, back to you. Excellent. Thanks, Steve. So now I was going to move into our desktop demos and uh, basically step through some of the more common ways of getting your uh, data into Oracle Spatial. And given that uh, most of you have actually used FME before, we'll perhaps skip fairly quickly through the first couple of examples and move into our multi-geometry support for Oracle um, and follow up with some uh, more advanced workspaces. So starting off with our importing GIS data into Oracle Spatial, what I've done here was set up a sort of skeleton workspace that showed importing data from a variety of different formats. So we had some AutoCAD data coming in, some map info data coming in, we have a non-spatial Oracle table that we want to work with, and also loading a raster JPEG 2000 file into our geo raster um, format. Because I'm working here with Oracle XE, the Express Edition, I can't load raster into it, so I also have to have a connection through to my 11.1.0.7 um, uh, database to do the, the raster and the point cloud work. So if we take a look at the workspace, let's start off with our AutoCAD data. And let's just have a quick look at what it looks like. We'll bring up a viewer here and pull in some AutoCAD data. 
And uh, those of you that have used it before, you'll be familiar with the fact that you have a number of parameters that dictate how the data comes into your workspace, whether or not you want to expand your blocks and what kind of uh, geometry, how you want to bring your geometry elements in. So we can bring this data into our workspace and take a look at it. When we open up the stuff in the viewer, which is always a good idea to take a look at your source data before you uh, start to work with it, you'll see that in here we've got some text string annotation data. And we also have line work and a number of block elements here showing the nodes on our water distribution. The interesting thing when working with text with your Oracle is that Oracle doesn't store text as one of its native formats. So when we read text data such as this, what we do with it is we extract out of the geometry information about the text. So we will pull in the text string, the text size, and the text rotation values, and store those as attributes along with anything else that's related to this data into the table in the Oracle database. So you'll see in the uh, universal viewer, this is a good place to see what those values are and how they might be pulled into your database. So if I go back to my workspace here and take a look, you'll see that here along the top, this is my annotation layer. And when I look at the attributes on my destination table, you'll see that height, rotation, and text string have been automatically generated for me to hold that data as a point value with those particular values associated with them. With my water lines, when I connect those up, you'll notice that there's a whole lot of attributes for them, which are automatically connected. Um, down the bottom here, I've got one that needs to be manually connected, because with Oracle, the table um, feature class names, or the attribute names, have to be in uppercase. And I had one float through from my source that was not in uppercase. Similarly, with my nodes, my block values that are coming in from my source, it may be that I want to keep some of that data so that I can then output it um, if I ever need to output this data again into AutoCAD, I've got some information about the data, such as things like the block name, the rotation values, and the scale that that block was originally um, placed at. So that's how I can build up a workspace to bring my AutoCAD data into my um, workspace. And if we take a look at it in Oracle, um, this is the, I'll have to just reconnect because I lost that connection. So let me connect again to my database and have a look at the tables. You'll see here I have tables for water meters and water lines. So taking a look at the water meters table, you'll see the annotation information that's showing in my water meters table. And of course, in the map viewer, in the newer SQL developer, you can take a look at that data. And here I am um, able to View that data through the map viewer, and you'll see my water lines here, looking very similar to the ones that I saw in my universal viewer. So that's getting simple data into my uh, Oracle table. If I've got more complicated data, for instance, I'm bringing in some map info data here, and I have map info with a limited number of um, attributes on it, and I want to take it into a parks table in my database where the database administrator has told me that it has to conform to this kind of output. So you'll notice it's got geometry on it, but it's also got a couple of extra fields that weren't in my source data. So to do that kind of transformation, I can connect up the values of the attributes that I do have, and then I can do things like add in additional um, transformation capabilities. I need a counter here to give myself a primary index. And I can do things to calculate the park area. So for those of you that aren't yet running um, an FME that has this new typing ability, you'll notice that you're able to type into the canvas of the workspace, and it will um, start to bring you out the transformers that you need to do the work. This is something that's become so useful that when I have to go back to an old version of FME, I can never figure out where to go find the transformers anymore. So as I add transformers into that flow, you'll notice that my uh, attributes have been mapped across. And so I'm adding value to this map info data and loading it into my Oracle database. So another example I had in my skeleton workspace here was the option here to transform non-spatial data into my spatial data. If we go take a look again at my Oracle database, I have a table out here of address point data. And when I look at the attributes on that address point data, you'll notice that I have X and Y columns that are holding the coordinate values, but they're not holding them as geometry. This is a non-spatial table 
with X and Y values sitting in the data. We can even see them here in our data if we scroll over. So my X and Y values. So what I'd like to be able to do is take those X and Y values and turn them into the kind of data that I need for my spatial address points data uh, table here, which is now holding the data in a, in a real geometry column. So to do this, I can connect up my non-spatial table to my spatial table, fix a couple of the mappings by using an attribute renamer. Because the attributes on my non-spatial table were a little bit different to the ones in my spatial table. So I have things like I have a primary index here to go over to my address ID and my street name through to my fully spelled out street name and a street type to go to street type. But the real the, the transformer that I need to transform that non-spatial table into my uh, spatial table is a 2D point replacer transformer. And I have a number of these kind of transformers that will do um, work on geometry. So I have 3D transformers that will do 3D point replacing or point adding, etc. And then I have 2D point replacers for working with 2D data. And what this does is allows me to pick out those columns that were my X and Y values and um, transform my non-spatial data into spatial data. Okay. So gradually I'm building up a workspace here that's loading data into my various tables of my database. And the last one to do is to load my JPEG 2000 file into my Oracle GeoRaster format. So that in fact turns out to be incredibly simple. We don't have to do anything fancy with that data. We just take our JPEG and load it up into the GeoRaster format. To take a look at what kinds of uh, writers are available to you with Oracle, if I want to add a writer and start typing in Oracle, you'll see these are the kind of um, writers that I can use. And I'm using that spatial GeoRaster writer to use for the GeoRaster. And the rest of it, I was using the Oracle relational, uh, the Oracle spatial object writer. For those of you still using spatial relational, you're probably not writing to it so much as reading from it. And that would be the option you would use for that particular data model. The Oracle SQL Loader writer here is designed to write out um, SQL that you can then use to load data into your database using the SQL and Oracle tools. Okay, so some basic demo on how to get data into your database uh, from a multiple of formats, loading non-spatial into spatial, and loading rasters in as um, geo-rasters. There is also the possibility of loading rasters in through a raster, some of the raster transformers that will take a raster and load it into a blob field for you so that you can attach a blob element to your table and hold the raster inside that blob element. But now let's move on and take a look at our multi-geometry support. Multi-geometry is new to FME 2011 and it's available to those kinds of databases that work with multi-geometry features. And the way we deal with multi-geometry is we have a number of new um, options on the reader and the writer for working with multi-geometry. So on my writer here, the, on this particular example, I've got some AutoCAD data that I'm going to um, bring into my uh, database. And let's go just take a look at it and we'll take a look at the database and then we'll follow through on the workspace. So the table that I'm going to be working with is the county table. And if we take a look at the attributes in it, it has um, just a simple ID for the county number. And then it has uh, geometry fields, one for the centroid of each of those counties, along with the polygon boundaries of that county uh, as a second geometry type column. We take a look at our source data in our universal viewer, just so that we can see what we're working with. And bring that in, you'll see that we've got this complicated uh, data set, and if I zoom down into it and we take a look at it, we can see that it's actually made up of a whole bunch of line work. So before we can uh, load this into our database, we need to generate polygons out of this line work. We'll have to simplify it a bit because there's an awful lot of indices along some of these, um, 
these wobbly uh, boundaries that are actually quick, quick beds. So we have a number of vertices there, too many for what we're trying to use. So we'll have to simplify that down. And then we're going to generate an inside point for each one of these polygons that we'll use to load up our multi-geometry column. So if we take a look again at our workspace, we're reading in the AutoCAD data. We're going to build those areas up. So we're going to use an area builder to build the area, the polygons for us. We're generalizing those polygons to get rid of some of those uh, vertices because there's just too many as it's come from CAD. You know those CAD guys, they like pressing the drawing buttons lots of times. And then we're going to use a counter to give ourselves a county ID for each one of these features. It is important when working with this kind of data and in attempting to create multi-geometry columns to have some kind of um, unique identifier on each of the features because we're actually going to be splitting, splitting the data into two streams. And so we split the data into two streams, one stream which is going to calculate the centroid for us and the other stream which is our polygon data. So to, to work with the multi-geometry, we need to set the name of the geometry for each of these features as it flows through the workspace. So our polygons, we want to have end up in our polygon geometry, and that's our county boundaries geometry. And then with the same data, we're also going to go off and create a center points. So we need to use center point replacer to replace the center points, and then name that geometry with the county centroids geometry name. So this name that we're naming the geometry has to match the name of the column in our Oracle database. Then what we do is we build that, those features up into aggregates. And so we generate, use an aggregator transformer to generate aggregates. And then we let the aggregate know that it's actually an aggregate of individual geometries. So we have an individual geometry set a parameter here, which we tell it is set to contain individual geometries. This way, when it hits the writer, the writer knows that that aggregate's coming through. It's got two, an aggregate of features in there, which is going to be written as one feature, and then the geometries go out into the correctly named columns. The last thing you need to do when working with multi-geometries is make sure that on the writer, you have a setting for handle multiple spatial columns set to yes, so that it knows to handle them as multiple spatial columns. So let's just turn on the um, visualizer here, and we'll take a look at what this data looks like when we run this process. I'm being very bold and leaving my database writer on here. Normally, if you were doing something like this, you might want to disable that database writer so that you can uh, check what your data looks like before you actually update your database with it. In this example also, Robin, uh, touches on one of the questions we have from one of the uh, people in the audience. Excellent. So do you want to give, share that one with no, everyone? Or no, not? It's, it's good. It's pretty okay. answered. Excellent. So here we've got our, um, we're visualizing our data and we can see that it's being visualized as an aggregate. And if I scroll down through the geometry, you'll see it's an aggregate which contains individual geometries. So we have a point geometry with the name of the centroids and a polygon geometry with the uh, name of the boundary polygons. And also, in addition, we have simplified that geometry down to a reasonable number of vertices. If I was attempting to read this multi-geometry in, it does the same thing if we need to uh, read that geometry as multi-geometry and we need to specify on the reader that we want to handle that geometry. Let me just do this quickly. Um, we're going to bring that in. We want the counties table. And you'll notice on the reader we have a new parameter also for handling multiple geometries, a handle multiple spatial columns. And we can turn that either to yes or no. If it's set to no, I believe it just reads the first column that it runs into, and that's the geometry that you get. If it has multiple columns and you type it in as a yes, then you'll get both. both. You'll get the feature as an aggregate with both geometries in it. This is also why the universal viewer doesn't do a very good job of displaying um, multiple geometry columns um, because you haven't got that option to specify which column it is you want to read, right? Okay, so enough on that. Again, this is new to FME 2007, uh, to 2011, and, um, and it will be, the support will be improving over the next release of the product. 
So the next section I wanted to touch off on was schema transformation and how this is being accomplished. And because that's such a big part of um, working with database data. We've used some fairly simple examples of getting data into our database using schema transformation. So, but in real life it isn't that simple. Not only do we need to be able to map the attributes from one schema to another, we may even need to map the feature types or do the mapping based on values in the incoming data. Then once we've got the data into the, work, into the database, we need to be able to pull it out and do schema mapping on the output process. Because almost invariably the CAD department doesn't want to see it the way the database sees it, they want to see it the way they're used to seeing it. So this involves some fairly intensive schema mapping and our traditional workspace would look something like this if we were going to be taking our tables out of our Oracle database and putting them into a format suitable for our CAD department. So if we take a look at this, we've got a fairly complicated workspace and basically what it's doing is reading each of the features in from our database and writing them out to various levels or layers in our drawing product. So here we're working with AutoCAD and we want to take each of our um, tables, for instance the airport table, and put it out to a C-AFLD layer within our database, within our AutoCAD file. And to do that we need to do things like um, using the attribute copy copier to map the attributes from the values that are in the database through to the values that the AutoCAD is expecting. So for instance that kind of thing or here we might have another bigger list of attributes, we're changing the case, we're changing the names and doing that kind of complicated schema mapping. So what we would have here in a traditional workspace is a, a number of the tables coming in and then attribute filters, attribute value mappers, doing things like mapping um, various incoming attributes to outgoing attributes. And generally the way you'd hold that sort of information is in a spreadsheet of some form or other. So here we have the actual mapping that we've got defined here. We have somebody has set this up for us and we need to obey this mapping in our workspace. So we're working with uh, water pipe information. So if the diameter is, comes in with a value of zero, what we want to do is set the AutoCAD color to a value of 130. 30. Or if the diameter comes in and it's got a value of 8, we want the AutoCAD color to go out as a value of 160. So that kind of manual mapping happens in things like these attribute value mappers. The biggest problem with this is if something changes in the mapping, we have to change both it, it both in the attribute value mapper and we have to change it in the Excel spreadsheet. And it would be really handy if we could do that, have that process happen automatically. And so the way we can do that is make use of a schema mapper transformer which takes that kind of manual mapping and does it for us within the workspace by reading that um, mapping file externally. So let's go and take a look at the new way of doing that kind of schema mapping. We also have the ability with the dynamic workspace um, option to create a workspace that then looks like this, where we have taken all the tables that we're interested in from our source data database, passed them through a schema mapper to do that mapping translation and then a dynamic writer to output that data into our AutoCAD with our features defined based on that schema mapping. In this particular case we end up with a rather more complicated schema mapping table. Things like incoming feature types equals roads, but the type of the road is a primary route. Then we want the features from that feature type to flow through to the C road center primary layer in our AutoCAD file. So we have a, a large CSV file here that's holding all our mappings and that's used by that schema mapper within that um, workspace. And I'd also like to point out, even though this uh, particular example, it is a CSV file that Robin's making use of, this could be an Oracle table in your, in your Oracle database as well that you manage for your mappings. Yes, absolutely. And so we could put that stuff into an Oracle database and then along with all these tables that we're interested in and it would all um, be managed and maintained in one place. So as the mapping changes, you can update your, your workspace automatically continues to work. What we're also using here on that source data is if we take a look, we have a, um, a parameter on our reader that says feature types to read and what we've gone, done here is set that to read the tables that we're interested in out of our database. 
And we accomplish that by also making use of the merge filter type here to merge those sources all through this one um, feature type that we're making, have here in our workspace. So for instance, if we use the prompt and run on our workspace, you can see that the feature types to read here actually goes out to the database and figures out which tables are in the database and prevents us with the options of which ones we want to use. So it makes for a very flexible workspace. The dynamic writer, on the other hand, is also doing interesting things with the dynamic parameters that are at the bottom of the feature type properties dialog box. So they're allowing you to pick up the schema definitions from the features as they come through. So by default, the feature type name is going to default from the value that's coming through. But there, again, there's all sorts of levels of complexity you can add to this process by picking up this information from various places. And the schema mapper transformer itself has been had a rework in FME 2011, so if it scared you off before, take a look at it again because it's got a new um, dialog boxes and it's a little bit easier to understand. In addition, um, Mark Island has done some great work with the evangelist in explaining the schema mapper. So if you go and take a look at the um, FME Evangelist postings on it, it becomes much easier to use. So I was just going to show you quickly how you could make a, a dynamic schema workspace and we do that on the Generate Workspace dialog box and it gives you the option now at the bottom here to pick the workflow option. So in the past, workflows were always considered to be static schema workflows, but to make a dynamic workspace you end up with this using this dynamic schema option on your dialog box. Okay, and that's what brings in that dynamic writer. Okay, so schema transformation, big when you're working with databases. It's very rare that the schema of your database matches the schema of whatever it is you're working with. So another couple of demos, just a couple more quick ones. We've got one on updating into our Oracle Spatial Database. And then I just wanted to run through with that LiDAR data showing you how you can get that out of your um, database and export it to an easily viewable format such as PDF. Oops. So let's go and just take a look at an updating workspace. Because once you've got your data into Oracle, you tend to have to need to update it on the fly from, um, with new information as it becomes available. So again, I just want to emphasize these workspaces are available on our website after this has been recorded. So if you're finding that these might be something that you want to use and in the future or you just want to have a, another look at them, they will be available on the web page. So here's an example of um, updating our spatial database. We're working with an address points table. In fact, that address points table that we put turned into a, a spatial table. So we're going to be that's an, it's a table of address points and we've been given some new address points that we want to have updated into that table. So this workspace also shows a couple of interesting new things that are available with FME 2011. What we're doing here is we've got um, a set of mid data that's boundaries for zip codes and we want to be able to specify which zip code we're working with and then we're going to go out and read the file that contains all the updates to our data. So we start off with our MIF mid data here and we fetch in a published parameter that selects the zip code that we want to work with so that we only work with data that's for a particular zip code, hence reducing the volume of data that we need to work with. So the feature reader is a new transformer for FME 2011. For those of you that have work, worked with Oracle for a while, the Oracle, the Oracle query was a way of being able to go out and query data based on a spatial relationship. And the feature reader has replaced that Oracle query and also opened us up to being able to do spatial queries on any one of a number of different formats. So here we have a GML file with a whole bunch of updates to our address points. And what we're going to do is use that feature reader to read in the address points and only perform, pass through this uh, feature reader the features that are contained within the MIF mid boundary for our zip code. So here we're doing spatial interaction with GML, which was not available to us in versions of FME before 2011. And if we just go back a step, you'll notice that there's lots of different formats you can use here. And in particular, some of them have their own implicit um, 
code for doing this kind of spatial interaction. So for instance, if I happen to be using an Oracle um, table here to do this kind of interaction, we'd see the list of Oracle options that are available to you, followed by the list of FME options for performing spatial interaction. So you see that with the kind of formats that have native code for doing spatial interaction. So that would be how we pick up the features that we want to read. We can expose the attributes that come through from that feature reader because we don't, they don't come in automatically. So we do need to expose to us the attributes that we want so that we can use them in our update. We're doing a timestamp here just so we can add some value to this data. So we've got, um, we're adding attributes for updating the time and who actually did the attribute updating. But the interesting transformer here is the attribute value mapper, which is setting for us a new attribute called FME underscore DB underscore operation that the writer is going to make use of to decide what to do with these features that are coming through into it. So what the FME DB operation does, it gets set to a value of insert, update, or delete based on a value coming in from our source data. And when the writer gets this feature, each one of these features will have this attribute on it with this particular value set to it, and the writer will then update, insert, or delete any matching features that match with that um, feature coming in. So what we also have to do on our destination is that we also have to set the key column that we're going to be using that's doing the matching. So we have a update key column of address ID. We have to make sure that we tell the writer that the table already exists. And then that updating process will happen with our spatial data. We can also update non-spatial tables this way. It's just a matter of getting that FMEDB operation you know, onto each feature and having it updated for you. Okay, so the last thing I just want to quick run through fairly quickly is the, um, an example of pulling that LiDAR data out of our um, database. And for this, I do have to use the latest FME 2012 beta because remember I said that the, um, this is only available in FME 2012. And what we've got the ability to do here is read from our point cloud data. And this looks like a complicated example at first glance, but mostly that's because of all the annotation that's in it. But basically what we're doing here is we have um, some data. Let me just take a quick look at it. We have some data here that's a, a boundary of an area that we've got of interest. So I have a microstation file that is, we're going to use to do some clipping of our point cloud data. So if I take a look here, my project site looks like this fairly simplistic polygon that I'm going to use for some clipping. And I also have my point cloud data that's defined in my Oracle database. You've seen that already. And along with that, I also have a JPEG file here that, was, that I can either use the original JPEG, but if I'm brave, I can attempt to use the one that we loaded up into our Oracle raster, um, data, into our database table. So what we're doing here is clipping both the raster and the point cloud data. So we have two clippies in here. We're clipping each of those data based on that um, area that we're of interest. We're going to use a tin generator to create a tin out of the point cloud data. Then we're going to drape the ortho photo or the geo raster over it to give it some appearance and write the whole lot out to PDF. What do you think my chances are, Steve? Can we give it a go? Yeah, very good, as long as you don't have the PDF file already open. That's right, I don't have the PDF <laughs> file already open, so let's uh, run this process and see how we get on. And if I go to my, um, looks like it's RAM, so let's go and take a look at our output here. And we'll see what we've got with our output. So you can see here what we've ended up with is a ortho photo or the geo raster clipped to our area of interest. We've managed to create a digital elevation model out of our point cloud data, and we've clipped it with a non, like a vector uh, file of microstation and to get our um, PDF. So that should impress the boss if he wants to know what we're doing with all that data that's in our Oracle database. 
Okay, so moving all along, we'll get Steve now to demonstrate for you some of our the capabilities with our FME server. All right, thanks everyone. Yeah, so this is just going to be a, a little introduction to what FME server can maybe uh, help with uh, your organization. Um, so what we have here is uh, FME server. Oops, we've got to go back. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so FME server just allows you an alternative way to run your workspaces. Um, you have a, a, an office with uh, several FME users, power users that author these workspaces. You're running them on your desktop. They're using a lot of uh, CPU, uh, maybe taking a long time to, to run. You need to leave your desktops on. In some cases, these are laptops. And you just want um, a way to offload that uh, CPU usage onto the servers, maybe take advantage of larger uh, um, CPU processing power and, and more memory on, on these servers. As we're working with Oracle databases, a lot of the the uh, transformations that you use could uh, take up a lot of memory, so it's that's an alternative for you. So, so it just uses uh, they're closely tied. The desktop and FME server are closely tied. They use the same engine as FME desktop. Uh, so all your translations or transformations that you create in your uh, workbench will run on FME server. Um, there's a a, a ride, uh We'll come to that in a sec. Okay, so we've got uh, so typically what you'll have in your environment is uh, several users running uh, workspaces, authoring these workspaces, uh, and they're testing these workspaces locally, and making sure everything's being created uh, correctly, and going out to your uh, shared folders or public access folders, and then somewhere on your network you're going to have FME server installed. And the users, these power users, will then publish these workspaces to FME server and run and then make this accessible to the rest. So then what you have is you have another group of users that may not even have access to FME server. They may be, or sorry, access to FME server or FME desktop, but they want to be able to run some of these data uh, workspaces. And, and with, uh, with FME Server, you basically have a web services that will allow uh, a wider audience to run these workspaces and obtain the data or uh, other information that they might need. So FME Server, uh, okay, yeah. So with FME Server out of the box, we do ship some services. Um, so we've got uh, different services here listed, how uh, we can, meet the needs of uh, the different um, users, user and business requirements. So we've got the data distribution, uh, which allows you to basically uh, have a self-service portal where um, users can uh, go in and we're going to be showing an example of that in a second and they can uh, indicate an area that they want to download data representing different formats. Uh, we have the data streaming service where we can actually download instantly a KML file and show it in Google Earth. Uh, maybe um, a live representation of what's happening in the Oracle database or, or, or the CAD files that you're wanting to upload into your CAD files for validation. In the next service, the upload and validation, that's where something like that could happen. And then we also have just the job submitter service where it's really just uh, offloading those jobs we spoke of or those workspaces we spoke of onto the central database so that jobs can be ran overnight, large jobs can be run over several hours and, and not interfere with your your, your local uh, desktop. So. All right, so the next slide here we've got um, a couple of city of Surrey's and for the sake of time we're gonna we're just gonna sh uh, reference these here but uh, Robin can pull them up on the web browser so we've got the city of Surrey here We've got, uh, this is running FME server in the back end, uh, integrated with, uh, I believe it's, is it uh, one of the uh, web browsers uh, like Bing's or Google Maps that can be used in this case. So we can select the data site uh, that we're interested in or the multiple ones. Select the formats, in this case the city of Surrey is only supplying AutoCAD and Esri, but as you know FME server could be used to extend that into other like, you know, Oracle data and whatnot. So, Enter your email address, and then we can, in this case, we have the ability to draw a box on the map. And then when we click on the download button, what's going to happen is we'll get a request going to the FME server in the background. 
And depending on the, the area of data that you're processing, as you can see here, we get a notice that this is going to take between five and 60 minutes. And what will happen is you'll get sent an email with a link to an FTP site there from the city of Surrey. So in the data catalog one, they've, they've gone a little bit different approach here. They're, they're essentially uh, giving you the ability to, to download uh, KML, DWG, and shapefiles. And we can click on any one of these, and it will take us to a uh, format that we can download. And this will be for the entire city of Vancouver. So unlike Surrey, which gives you the ability to select an area, this here is actually pulling back the data download immediately right away on once uh, processed. So. So some of this may be static data, some of it may be, uh, well, I think in this case, this one's using static data. However, it's all been generated overnight or on a regular basis using FME server running jobs that just produce the data. Cool. So you can find out when your apartment's going to have a recycling schedule. Yeah. And with FME server, we also have a, a user interface that um, is delivered out of the box. Um, yeah, if you can go to home there, Robin, that'd be great. Log in. So this user interface is delivered out of the box. It's, it's really uh, uh, the, the administrator user and author users that publish up to FME server would publish to one of these existing services and may register with that service. So if we expand one of those, we'll see under here we've got a, a workspace that can be ran. Um, the user can actually go in there and set some attributes if necessary. In this case here, we've got uh, feature groups to download, so you can select different features. And all this is out of the box with FME Server. But on top of this, what can be done is uh, any of the organization or businesses that have specific business needs, they can actually, using FME API, the REST API, they can integrate with FME Server into their web mapping product, uh, you know, something like uh, GMedia Web Map or, or Azure Arc, uh, ArcGIS Server kind of thing. So, so these are just a few quick examples. We just want to pique your interest in FME Server here at this point. Um, this is an Oracle uh, webinar, and we know working with large data sets, uh, FME Server could help your, your business process these uh, workspaces more efficiently. Yes, and in fact, that uh, the dynamic workspace that we showed you earlier is very similar to what's been set up behind this data download service. So basically, select the tables out of the database that you're interested in, select the output format that you want it to go to. So we've been given an option set of options here. Select the coordinate system that you'd like to see it come out in, that sort of thing. And so basically, you build your workspaces underneath to provide the end user with the kinds of options that you want them to have. So thanks, Steve, for that. That's great. Um, and there are a number of various uh, public sites out there, and we also have a few on our own um, on our own website for you to have a look at as well. So now we come to our next poll, and it's a winning poll. Yes, so there's so, an opportunity for you guys to win some free training. We've got uh, two courses with ten seats each. I've just launched that poll there now. So we've got uh, an FME desktop course we're offering, uh, and also as, uh, an FME for spatial database courses that we're going to need to be running. We don't actually have the dates for this finalized yet, but we'll have that in the next week or so, I'm told. And uh, so any of you that are interested, please uh, respond and we'll uh, hopefully um, be able to fit you in there. All right? Yeah, these are online courses. They, um, the FME desktop is two mornings or two afternoons or something, so uh, four hours and four hours. And the spatial database course is just a one morning, four hour course. So it goes into a lot more detail about working with your uh, databases. All right, uh, I'll give you guys another five or ten seconds to finish uh, submitting your votes there. And you'll be, uh, the winners will be contacted next week, and apparently somebody in the background can figure out who you are, and don't you just love Big Brother looking over your shoulder? But sometimes it's a, a good thing. So. All right, All right. thanks everyone uh, for that. I'm going to close that now. All right, back to you, Robin. Great. So more ways of getting acquainted with FME. If you aren't uh, familiar using FME already and you'd like to uh, try it out, um, there's a trial version that you can download from our website that you can use for evaluation purposes. We can also be contacted and we'll give you a personalized web demo. And then there's also an intro to FME desktop webinar, which we give fairly frequently, but is also available to you in our catalog of re recorded webinars. So you can go there and get that webinar and it will explain more about how we actually use FME desktop if you haven't used it before. For those of you that are um, regular FME customers and have passed through that stage, there's lots of uh, information on our website about tutorials. We have some demos. 
We've got these upcoming training courses, in particular the one on FME and spatial databases. And then we're doing these series of webinars every couple of weeks. So the ones that are coming up, there's one in a couple of weeks which uh, Steve is working on right now that will be Intergraph and FME. And that'll be worth taking a look at. Um, there's one on the Esri Community Maps program. And then the Inspire, if you happen to be in Europe, the Inspire project. And yet again, another one on Geodatabase and FME. So basically what you've seen today is just a quick look at FME Desktop. We've looked at the workspace and the transformation tools and the Oracle readers and writers. We had a quick look at the FME server with different services for accessing the FME workspaces and a way of improving the scalability of your FME tasks. So today's, just a reminder, today's webinar was recorded and we'll be contacting you um, within the next two business days with a link to where that webinar will be so that you can share it with your friends and colleagues. And so now just before we wrap up, we've got just a few more minutes left for there um, any more questions and answers. So I've got three people in here frantically typing away. There must have been some interesting question or answer that uh, one of you might be prepared to share with the audience. Well, the questions were a little slow in starting off, but then we've been inundated. So um, there was a couple of questions about uh, multiple geometry support. Um, how does FME handle more than one sp spatial column? So I think you illustrated that with the multiple geometry uh, support. Um, also, a question, a good question about support for different coordinate systems in multiple geometry columns. That is a little trickier, um, but yes, FME can do that, but it um, uh, depends what you want a, the end result to be, because of course, many times if you read multiple spatial columns from your oracle, you need to break those up if you're going into a format that doesn't support multiple spatial columns like shape or Esri geodatabase. So the handling of the end result may uh, make things a little trickier. Great. Right. Thanks for that, Mark. Okay, so uh, any remaining questions that we have that are unanswered, we will definitely follow up with you. There are still a few coming in, and please feel free to respond, uh, continue responding, and we'll run the uh, webinar for another, I guess, uh, Aaron, one another five or ten minutes. Um, so, you know, if there's any questions you still have you're thinking about, or if we picked your interest somewhere, please uh, keep putting them in, and we will get back to you. We have your uh, contact information. And uh, there will be a follow-up email being sent out following the webinar in the next few days once we get the recording produced and made available on our website. And I think uh, if there's anything else after you leave the webinar that comes to mind, you can, uh, you can also uh, contact us at support at safe.com. Okay, and so that yes, so here you've got info at safe.com for uh, basic, more salesy kind of info information. And then if you want um, support, feel free to contact support at safe.com. Um, if it's specifically relating to the webinar, feel free to contact support and say that you heard me, um, either myself, Robin, or Steve talking, and we have an, a, a specific question. So, okay, um, and then I'm told that's it. We we're done. Yeah, we're yep. done. This but is we'll. Leave the questions up and we'll, so bear with us if we haven't answered your question and we'll get back to you shortly. And like we said earlier, if we don't get back to you right now, the session will definitely respond in the following days. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks very much.